Welcome, relatives. My name is Lorenzo Serna. I'm an, I am Indian Collective's Director of Tactical Media. My pronouns are they, them. I'm Chicanx, Chican E, and I am so excited to bring you to this conversation about building movements during times of state repression. We're going to be joined by Nick Tilson, Indian Collective's President and CEO, Mary Hooks, Movement for Black Lives National Field Secretary, and Lena Nasur, Palestinian Youth Movement Organizer. Uh, for an Indian live discussion about the tools and tactics utilized by the state to repress our movements and how our community organizers are, I mean, the community organizers are cultivating systems of support and care as they continue to mobilize. And also just, you know, as you're joining us, don't be afraid to hit that like, follow, share, let us know where you're watching from. If you have questions, drop them in there. We'll see if we can get to them, but also we can send them on to the, the guests as well. So we're going to bring everybody in right away. I don't like to waste any time, but again, just really thankful to be joined by everyone. Let's bring them in. Boom. Hey. What's up? Hey. So um, we're, we're going to do like a quick just intros. I think that we'll start with some intros. Let some folks know who you know who you are, what you've been up to. Um, and we'll just go around. Uh, we're going to start with Nick. And so, so Nick, if you can just introduce yourself a bit more and share about your community and what you're currently holding as an organizer. And then, uh, yeah, this... We'll just take it from there. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Nick. Uh, I'm a Nick Tilson, a Machiapi, Chantea, Washtenap at Chuzapalo. I uh, greet you in my Lakota language. Um, calling in here from the Chesapa in the Black Hills. Uh, I'm Oglala Lakota. Um, I organize in the, the lands of the Osheti Shakoni, which are my homelands. Uh, it's also the, the, the headquarters, the international headquarters of Indian Collective. Um, you know, what we've been navigating a lot here is that, you know, Indian Collective is a movement infrastructure organization and meaning that we do both the work of resourcing the indigenous people's movement. Uh, we do on the ground organizing of the indigenous people's movement. Um, we engage in um, both land back and uh, activities and nonviolent direct action, community organizing. Um, you know, we're at a pivotal moment in uh, in history here, where we continue to hold up the the mirror to America, and um, and so our work has been to you know um, bring to light the challenges that 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 exist for the Indian, indigenous people, and I think so well, when we do so unapologetically uh, in our power, you know we have been consistently. Uh, attacked you know our organization's been in existence for six years and four of those six years we've been in litigation uh you know some of those litigations include fighting against legislation to limit the right to protest and to mobilize uh here on our homelands and some of them are experiencing uh, litigation against me personally as one of the leaders of this organization um, and so we've been navigating a lot, um, you know, but at the same time, we have not let that deter us one bit, you know, from the resourcing work that we do to fighting on the front lines to organizing, you know, historically, a lot of those things did not happen in one organization, but we have been working really, really hard um, to be an, to be a resource to the movement and to the people. And so we're experiencing a, a variety of different um, things, uh, but we also believe that it's so important to stand in solidarity. And that's where, you know, we have deplo deployed affinity groups um, to the Cop Stop City movement and have put boots on the ground there. Uh, we have also, uh, you know, deployed affinity groups, you know, to uh, to support solidarity in the Palestinian struggle for a ceasefire and for the liberation of their people, of, of their people, uh, as well as community organizing right here on the front lines against um, the, the killing of Native American people at the hands of the Rapid City Police Department. Um, you know, leading efforts with tribal leaders to fight for our land back and, uh, you know, organizing the streets. Uh, and, and and so we're an organization uh, that continues to do that. You know, we are continuing to fight for the freedom of Leonard Peltier, who is one of the oldest, uh, longest incarcerated indigenous political prisoners in American history. Um, and, um, 
So there's a variety of different things that we're doing and we're experiencing a lot of pushback uh, because they're not used to indigenous people having uh, power in, in, mer in various different forms. And so uh, I have seen that, uh, you know, front and center. We can hop into more of it later too. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Nick. I uh, hope people are taking notes because that was a lot of stuff going on, you know. Um, we're going to keep handing it off. I want to hear from, from everybody here before we get into the, the convo. But uh, Mary, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, just give us a little bit more information about like uh, your community and what you've been currently holding as an organizer. <laughs> I was, uh, that's a loaded question, but I'll try to keep it simple. I'm Mary Hooks. I use she and her pronouns. Uh, I'm part of the leadership of the Movement for Black Lives based here in Atlanta. And a lot of uh, the work that I've been holding lately uh, definitely has a lot to do with uh, the cop city struggle that's uh, been happening here for over the last, over three years now, and um, been advancing the struggle around the cop city vote, uh, specifically to get cop city on the ballot to allow for direct democracy. So everyday people can decide and determine what gets built in our communities. Um, and we've been seeing the state repression uh, show up in that fight and I'll talk more about, about that. So that's been a big part of the work. And then also, uh, as you know, we've been talking to our people about, you know, um, why we're saying we don't want a cop city, why we're saying that investing in police is, you know, uh, detrimental and horrible uh, and has grave impacts on black and brown communities. Um, you know, oftentimes we're met with this question about, well, who are we gonna call? And so part of my work has been working with a set of black women in my neighborhood uh, to do the political education analysis building with an eye toward what is the alternative that we wanna build in our neighborhood and community in order to make sure that uh, when our folks call that question that we have and not just an answer, but also can demonstrate uh, the new ways that we want to be in relationship to one another in our communities when harm happens or even to prevent harm. Uh, and then also, you know, our, our mayor has done a job of painting this picture that, you know, it's just outside agitators that don't want Cop City when we know that that's a lie. And so um, over the last few weeks, uh, I've been helping to mobilize uh, a set of black women to bring awareness to and bring our voices and leadership into the struggle around Cop City to make it very clear that um, there are many people concerned about Cop City and particularly black women. And I'll again talk more about that later. And then broadly, um, Oh, I think it's also important too. We uh, kicking off a movement choir uh, actually this Sunday, uh, which is also part of a safety resilience strategy. We'll talk more about that. Uh, in addition to um, uh, later in the spring hosting a radical popular uh, theater workshop along with our comrades, Aji Harte, based out of Puerto Rico, um, in order for us to bring more of our cultural practices into the work that we do uh, in the streets to advance the struggle uh, to stop Cop City. And then nationally, m bl has uh, launched a campaign, the National People's Response Campaign, which calls the question and challenges, um, you know, the state to take more seriously and to you know, provide and divert resources uh, to make sure that there's holistic care as it relates to folks who are, um, you know, having police encounters. Then we we want to say, look, folks struggling with mental health, like we need a different response. And we're as we continue to, you know, um, to radicalize people around the ideas of abolition, we know many of our people are clear that folks experiencing mental health, there is no reason why the police are being the first ones to be called. And it's um, the responsibility of um, of the of these state institutions while we're staying put, putting money into, you know, putting money into it as taxpayers, that that money should be diverted and new programs and systems be created in order to address, uh, address mental health crises. And, I was, uh, there's some other stuff in the works, but for the sake of time, I won't go into it all, but I will name that, um, you know, we're clocking that there are many, many, many uh, other cop cities that are being built. And so um, we are doing some work to uh, connect those struggles across the country. And I'll, I'll leave that like that. Thank you for having me. For sure. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for, again, all of that information. I was like, why are Tell me more. <laughs> uh, um, okay, so we, we also have one more guest here. Uh, Lena, if you can introduce yourself a bit more, share about your community and what you're currently holding as an organizer. 
uh, take it away. Yeah. Um, thank you for having me. I'm Lena Nasser with the Palestinian Youth Movement. Um, we are an organization of Arab and Palestinian youth uh, in so-called United States, so-called Canada, and also in Britain. Um, and our role, we really see our role as empowering our communities, especially our youth, to take an active role in our liberation struggle and to confront and dismantle Zionism wherever we find it. Um, I think in terms of you know what we're carrying right now as an organization, and me as an organizer is pretty obvious. We are 167 days into a genocide, um, a genocide that's been live streamed all across the world and is really obvious for anyone to see. Um, a lot of our work has been trying to stop that genocide, to put pressure on our electeds, to um, partake in mass mobilizations, to lead mass mobilizations. Um, we're calling for arms embargo. Um, really, anything that we can do to put pressure here uh, in order to to stop this genocide has taken the lives of at least 30,000 Palestinians in Gaza. Um, I think in terms of state repression, you know, Palestine is a really clear anti-imperialist struggle and it's been historically a lightning rod for other struggles and has always been repressed and surveilled in our community. Um, and when I say community, I mean, broadly speaking, the Arab and Muslim community here on Turtle Island has also been largely surveilled um, and repressed. And we've seen all kinds of, and we'll get into, I'm sure, all the details, but, you know, we're seeing that even more so heightened really in this moment as we are taking to the streets and demanding not just um, an end to this genocide, but also the full liberation of Palestine. And um, we've seen that really come to roost here, too, in, in terms of the dehumanizing propaganda that's been used to um, to garner support for this genocide being brought here onto Turtle Island. And um, we've seen, for example, the, the stabbing to death of a six-year-old boy in Chicago um, while his landlord screamed, you Muslims must die, uh, and also other stabbings here in Texas. So um, we'll get more into, I'm sure, the, the different kinds of, um, kinds of repression that we've been facing, but it's really, really been heightened in this moment. Thank you. Um... Thank you for sharing that and yeah this it's, it's really real out there and, and and thank you i know that it's hard to hear the things that are happening but sometimes we just we have to hear them so we can change them so thank you for, for sharing that um so we're gonna we're gonna oh, do you have any questions for, for anybody before i kind of just dive into this next question i have for y'all yeah. yeah. i i just wanna i just wanna i mean uh uh we we, we sometimes have these conversations about you know the politics of the moment that we're in. Um, but I just want to send some mad love to you and your people. You know, we, we, we one, one of our, one of our um, ceremonies that we do, um, you know, one of our ceremonies that we do here is called welcoming the thunder back. Um, mm. We welcome the thunder beans back and we go to the highest point in the black Hills and we make prayers for the thunderstorms that are coming for the people. And, uh, you know, when we went up there, so yesterday, the first day of spring, we went up there and prayed and we brought offerings, but we made, we brought, you know, a bunch of us wore these in solidarity, not because it's the thing to do right now, but because the prayers that we are making up there, the prayers that we are making up there, our solidarity is real in, in what's going on. And that we asked our ancestors that have come before, you know, so I just wanted to acknowledge that because sometimes I feel like we, we jump right into the analysis because we're just fighting all the time. Um, but but also just want to say that, uh, you know, uh, the people from both of your communities have been in our prayers up, in, uh, up here in what we do too. So uh, I just wanted to share that before we before we get all the way into the conversation too. Yeah, that that's beautiful. I appreciate that. I think. Um, I forgot to also mention that I'm now on the board of For Honor of the Earth. And so I think in saying that, what I, I mean here is I have always been so um, grateful for and um, inspired by indigenous struggle globally, especially here on Turtle Island and the immense amount of solidarity that we have between our peoples and the shared experiences, not, not exactly the same, but really a lot of shared and, um, experiences and parallels between our struggles. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thanks for. Yeah. Once 
that once we started talking, I was like, oh my gosh, this this such a, this topic is, is so real and so heavy, and and we have to to let it be what it is, you know, and not try to just just slide through it, skate past. Um, saying that, we go to the next question. Uh, but this is an important question. So, uh, Lena, the state implements various tactics to control our communities uh, when they resist harmful systems. Um, could you discuss the types of tactics you and your communities have experienced at the hands of the state? Yeah, that's a that's going to be a long list. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, so I think, like I would say, that tactics I think have shifted over, you know, depending on what the moment is. But we've seen a lot of different patterns. Um, there's, for example, legislative and like official attacks on our movement. Um, right when October 7th happened, we had, for example, ICE and the FBI visiting mosques and the homes of Arabs and Muslims. Um, we also had FBI and DHS uh, issue a public safety alert about the different protests, even though there was, there was no credible evidence that um, there was any you know, violence or anything negative that was happening. But um, we've had different actors by the state uh, try to smear our uh, all the different protests, not just our, but the different protests in support of Palestine and opposed to genocide, claiming that we're tied to different factions back home. Um, we've also really seen heightened attacks on our ability to mobilize in this moment and uh, heightened charges that we, I wouldn't say unprecedented, but that we're not, we're, aren't used to seeing. So like, for example, in the Bay Bridge, the Bay Bridge 78 um, got slapped with the charge of false imprisonment. Luckily, those charges were eventually dropped, but um, that's a wild charge for protesting on a bridge. Um, in New York, we've seen police come up with new rules arbitrary rules every time there's a protest and um, they use that as an excuse to target organizers and arrest organizers. So dozens of organizers in New York have been arrested in this way. Um, and there's many, a much longer list beyond that. Um, I think to also add to that, imperialism and Zionism are dominant ideologies in our current culture and our current society. And so um, when we talk about repression, I think it's important to say it's not just the state and its official organs that are oppressing us, but different non-state actors that um, do that work as well and sometimes work in tandem with the state, like the ADL, for example. And so we've seen uh, you know, censorship by organizations like Meta. Um, we've seen a lot of different Zionist institutions go after Palestinian organizers and organizations um, through civil lawsuits. So the one that um, AMP is currently going through. We've also seen a lot of increased doxing, especially of the student movement. Um, there was a period of time where there were trucks that were going around different college campuses with different students' faces and names. Um, and it's really become, you know, there, there's an attempt to create this climate of fear um, to organizing. Uh, and that's not to mention other kinds of private company retaliation, people being fired or investigated by HR over different personal posts or statements made on in, for Palestine. Um, there's a much, much longer list, but I'll, I'll use that. Um, I think actually what I'll end with here is one of the biggest uh, tools of state repression, of official state repression, is the threat of material support for terrorism charges, uh, which are really vague and ill-defined and can really be um, used uh, to to stifle our movement and to make it very difficult to organize and make people afraid to organize. Um, and it's something that uh, is so important for us to overcome and continue to organize despite all of these different um, these different attacks from all these different places. You know, they're trying to attack our infrastructure and they're also trying to attack our internal cohesion. And I think those are the two most important pieces that we need to protect as we build despite all of this repression. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, yeah. And it's true, like the, the charges get get wild. I, I went I was there for this once. I went I was in jail charged with jaywalking for a few days once, you know. Everyone else was like, Why are you in here? I'm like, Oh I guess I was jaywalking and they were like, Wow. Um but yeah, so this gets it gets it gets, it gets it's more and more serious. Um Mary, if you can if you can um answer the same question. Um that was a lot of information too, and again I hope people are taking notes. Like this is this is happening across all, the, all of our movements across the movement, if you will, um, this, the, the, the different litigations, different uh, trumped up charges, and, and these things are unfolding. And, and once they do them, they're going to keep doing them. So if you, the state implements all these tactics, uh, do, you, do you, you know, start to control our communities when they resist harmful systems? And so could you discuss the type of tactics that you, you've been seeing in you know, City, but against like the movement for black lives? Um, and what have you experienced at the hands of the state? 
Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think what uh what is probably the most well known right now is the current uh, RICO charges that have been waged on 61 uh, people thus far, um, and you know that came after uh, that was what last spring, last summer after the uh, raid that happened in um, the Wilani Forest um, during a week of action and folks being hit with domestic terrorism charges. And the state legislature in Georgia has gone back to say, how can we actually make this even more ridiculous um, by, you know, tying certain activities like um, one of the one of the comrades is being held because they posted up pictures of the police officer who murdered uh, Tortiquita. Um, and so they're trying to find any, um, what is in quote unquote normal times, uh, what is what any average person would say, this is, you know, just a simple act of resistance, you know what I mean? It's whatever, um, they're finding ways to attach simple um, acts of resistance in order to be able to say, yes, this can be escalated, uh, the level of property damage, you know, or things like that, that can now um, make, you know, simple stuff like that become, you know, they can tack on uh, domestic terrorism. And we're also seeing um, it show up in the voter suppression. And I had mentioned before with the um, with the cop city vote and the strategy to put cop city on the ballot, uh, we have seen our mayor, you know, use the court system as a way to uh, stall to try to prevent uh, the 116,000 petitions that we gathered uh, over the summer to prevent folks from engaging in direct democracy uh, and to suppress again direct democracy excuse me, direct democracy and, um, you know, essentially telling people that we don't give a, we don't give a crap what you, what your opinions are. We don't care what, you know, a, a large portion of folks who live in this city and call it home, think about um, what they're doing and the decisions that they're making that deeply impacts our lives. Um, and then of course the raids that happen, uh, which, which has been, um, you know, severely uh, tra traumatizing to those who uh, have had to experience that, not to mention the ways in which we have seen the police officers be um, be heinous in the way in which they engage people, the way in which they've abused dogs, the ways in which they have pulled uh, folks out of their homes without shirts on and taking pictures of, the, of folks um, uh, without shirts on and, and, and just moving in such an undignified way. And then even even as small as, as things like, we've seen uh, folks' cars get booted and people have their cars towed after a mobilization. Um, and I have a, you know, a comrade of mine who, uh, and we believe that it, it was no accident, but uh, a few months ago, the police shows up at her house, uh, helicopters, uh, six, seven police cars, two o'clock in the morning, uh, threatening to uh, bust down her door, all because she missed a court date from a ticket uh, about her dog being off the leash. And so we're seeing this level of hostility um, that is being met with every interaction, every interaction, it's met with the level of hostility to either agitate uh, in order to try to say, yeah, you resist an arrest or you, you know what I mean? Something like that, or you've been disorderly um, while also, um, you know, just trying to assert their, uh, uh, and their abuse of power and, and their dominance, right? And so those are some of the ways in which we're seeing it manifest. And I feel like in this time, you know, we've been watching, of course, of course, as we see and understand and know that the, the struggle around not only Atlanta's cop city, but the other cop cities that are being proposed and built um, in deep relationship to what is happening uh, to uh, folks in Palestine and the ways in which we have seen um, students and young people uh, and folks all over the country be criminalized for uh, standing up righteously, righteously against genocide. And so uh, we are not, we are not going to be surprised. We are not surprised the way the state continues to escalate their tactics of repression. Um, and, you know, we continue to like learn and put our ear to the ground, the ways in which folks are maneuvering and trying to, uh, you know, like move through the maze of the police state we are in, you know, and that's what it feels like in a lot of ways. It feels like a, a maze full of booby traps um, 
And at the same time, we will not be uh, we will not be moved. We will not be moved because we know that um, if we if we stop moving, then of course that that plays right into what they want. They don't want a vibrant movement. They want to they want a people that are afraid. They want a people, you know what I mean, that are unwilling to speak out. And this is a time, if no other time, if no other time, uh, this is the time that we as as humans have to uh, be even more assertive in our demand for uh, for human rights and our demand for um, you know um, for true democracy and our demand for uh, holding the U.S. empire accountable and all of its cronies and all of the folks as you name. Um, Lena about around the other non-state actors who also are playing a role. Like this is the time and the moment for our people to stay um, unmoved and are resolved uh, to advance the human rights struggle. Thank you for that. Um, Nick, I'm just gonna ask the same question. You know, I, I think um, we're getting a lot, of, a lot of good insight, but again, you know, the state's implementing all these different tactics to try to, you know, criminalize our communities and like how, you know, can you discuss just what's been happening in your community and what, what tactics the state has been using um, and, and share that for, for the people? Yeah, for sure. I, I also, I think the important, the important thing is in context too, right? So um, it's what's, it, what's, what's been happening, which I'll get into, but the context of how it's happening. You know, we're Indi indigenous people in South Dakota are 10% of the population in South Dakota, but make up 52% of the people that are incarcerated in the state. Um, at Indian Collective, we have done a lot of work to resource the movement. In fact, what Indian Collective has done to resource the indigenous people's movement has never happened in the history of our movement, uh, in the history of our work. You know, so we like, for example, we've helped to rematriate, rematriate and distribute over $80 million in resources to 900 indigenous led efforts throughout Turtle Island. Uh, you know, from the Gwich'in in the north, all the way to the Zapatistas in the south, to the Kanakas, you know, all the way to the Passamaquoddy and the Aquasosnes to the east. And while we're doing that work, we're also organizing on the front lines in our community right here uh, in a community where just two years ago, a local, you know, a local uh, hotel called the Grand Gateway, who said they couldn't tell the difference between the bad Indians and the good Indians. And so we're not going to provide service to any of them. And uh, we filed some federal civil, li civil rights lawsuits against them. And so did the Department of Justice too. While we're doing all that work, we're bringing to light one of the longest existing battles over land in the history of the United States judicial system, which is the which is the fight for the Black Hills that has been going on for generations. And while Indian Collective is doing work all throughout Indian country and supporting the self-determination of indigenous people throughout Indian country, we're right here on the ground. So it's a substantial risk that we're taking. We're also hold, working to hold the police accountable here. Since the death of George Floyd in, in 2020, there's been six murders at the hands of the Rapid City Police Department here. Um, all of those murders have been of indigenous people. There never has been one charge filed. And so, you know, the kind of charges that we've seen from the, the protest at Mount Rushmore to what we're seeing now, charges like robbery, grand theft, simple assault, aggravated assault, obstruction, disorderly conduct, resisting arrest. These types of charges, you know, in the short period of time, in the six years that we've been in existence, I personally have been facing almost 40 years of time in prison for the charges that have been brought against me. And if you read those charges out that I'm talking about right now, it's also part of a narrative narrative war. Not only are they trying to lock you up in a context that I just laid out, but they're trying to make you look like a criminal. 
They're trying to make you, instead of a, a solutionary and a revolutionary, they're trying to make you look like criminals. You know, when I was arrested at Mount Rushmore, they in, the FBI came in and interviewed all of, all of the Conrads. And not one of them interviewed me. Why? It's because it's a tactic to try to separate our movement. To try to, to try to try to a tactic to try to create fear amongst our movement, try to infiltrate our movements. So navigating in these things, and then they drag on legal battles for a really long time, and they drag on legal legal battles to try to to get to, to get you to um, break a condition of your release. To try to get to try to break a condition of your release that says you won't violate the law because you've been put on bond and they the longer that they drag out the trial whether it's charges that will stick or not they drag them out so long that uh you know you you you, you can they can try to put you back in jail by um violating the conditions of your release every single time even right now for me as the I'm the president of the largest international indigenous organization that's existed in history. Every time I have to leave the Seventh Circuit Court, this the place in which I'm currently living, I have to get permission from the judge. I uh, if I'm going to go show solidarity over here, I got to get permission from my ju from the judge. I have to go to raise money for my organization, I get permission from the judge. You know, I got to go to a a basketball game for my for my children outside of the seventh seventh circuit because we live in the country out here i got to get permission from the judge it's a way of controlling your every aspect of your life all of the funders and the supporters that support indian collective and support our communities and our partners these charges come up in underwriting when they're trying to give us resources and try to give us support too so there's a real impact on some of these strategies, not to mention the impact that it has on families. You know, my children, my family, my where, where, they're, where they're hovering these over. Because one would say, well, these charges will never stick. Well, what happens when I'm an all-white jury, supposedly of my fear, of my peers, and in a, in a state where, you know, we're making up 10% of the population, but our 52% of the people that are incarcerated, the stakes are high, right? The stakes are really, really high. They try to, um, so all of these conditions that we are organizing in, whenever we do stand in solidarity with other movements, just like we did with Cop City, just like we did with our Palestinian brothers and sisters, um, the stakes become really high for us. The stakes become really high for us because of what the perse persecution is happening on the ground. So they're trying to separate us even more. They're trying to stop movements from converging. Um, they're trying to stop us from be having true solidarity with each other. They're trying to isolate us uh, because they know that we have power together. So these are, you know, these are some of the things uh, that we're seeing, you know, we're also seeing like, you know, some people don't even know that there's there's lawsuits literally going on right now, still from Standing Rock. You know, still from Standing Rock, they're trying, they're they're doing depositions, and they're and, and there's in 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 this current climate, what's happening in the deposition process, whether they be criminal matters or civil court, through depositions, the other side who are who are representing the oil companies, the pipelines, the mining companies, the extractive industries, and the federal government, through dep depositions, they're trying to capture information. They're trying to capture information through those depositions. Whether they can win or lose that particular lawsuit, they're trying to collect information about how we organize ourselves. Who are, what kind of alliances that we have? Who do we organize with? How do we organize our resources? How are we prepared to fight against legal and political repression. So these are the things that are in the conditions that we're, we're currently in, you know, and when you look at what's happening in this political moment in, in the country, they're trying to make everybody who is fighting for social justice look like terrorists. 
instead of people fighting for positive change in this world. They're trying to make us seem like that we're unreasonable, that we're unprof unprofessional, that we're, that we're you know, unworthy, that we're not legitimate. Yet we're the ones who have built narratives from the ground up in our communities that are creating radical change throughout this country in a time that is absolutely imperative. So these are the things that, you know, we're experiencing uh, here um, and um, what we're navigating, you know. All right. Thank you for that. That's a little... That's the situation. Not, 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 not easy. You know, it sounds like there's there's a lot going on. Um, it's hard to organize in a way where you're not going to be attacked by the state. There's they're using a lot of different tactics to do it. You know, and 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 they're, they're ongoing. You know, they're ongoing, and and they affect not only ourselves but our family, our communities, our, rel our relatives, our you know, like our children. It's like this is what's happening, and 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 what people are doing. You know, like a. There's an article from from Grist about Standing Rock. He's talking about Standing Rock. I was like, I'm not going to mention Standing Rock. But anyways, Standing Rock, and they're talking about how like they had FBI agents in there, and they're like, oh yeah, there was a bunch of people hanging out. They weren't doing nothing. You know, that was the report. It's like, oh, they seemed like the, to mostly just not be doing like small small things. There was no big deal, you know. But they spent the resources. You know, they sent the people in there. Mm -hmm. And so, the next question is like, so this is what's going on. You know, as we're fighting for liberation, the state's response with, in alliance with corporations and, like, different state actors, non-state actors, as we said, you know, there's people driving vehicles around doxing their relatives, you know. Um, as that's happening, like, these institutional systems of harm are surrounding us, and we're trying to build up our communities within our communities. Could you share about how to resist, you know, how you resist, how you tear down, but then also how you build and cultivate systems of care and support? You know, because like, um, you know, one thing I learned all the time is like, we all we got, you know, this is it. Hey, you know, if we're not taking care of each other, that means that, you know, there's going to be less of us tomorrow. You know, we're not, we're at, we're not building a community that we're not going to grow. And so I'm kind of wondering what, what, um, you know, what are these systems of care and support that we're trying to build? And I'm going to start with Nick. Um, if you want to start uh, sharing if, if what you got. And then we'll go, we'll go down the line again. So, so Nick, that's the question to you. Like, as this is all happening, how are we taking care? Like, how are we building up systems of care and support? I can share a little bit. I mean, about about what we're doing, um, and we're learning. You know, we're we're learning too because it's not, um, you know, but this whole thing of like, you know, we are the ones who keep us safe. That has never been more true. That has never been more fucking true than right now. You know, we say that in speed. You know, we say that in chance. But that shit is true because if we don't keep ourselves safe, we know damn well they're not going to. Um, and so some of the stuff that we've done here at Indian Collective is just realizing the reality in the anticipation that not will, you know, is it possible they're going to bring charges? The expectation is that every single time that we mobilize to the streets, whether something feels like it is an arrestable or non-arrestable action, we anticipate that they are going to bring charges up against our people. And they might not bring them against our people on that day. <laughs> they might they might collect the information on that day and then bring them way, uh, way later. And so having, uh, you know, having constantly raising resources for us so that we can expect to fight against the legal charges that are coming, even if those legal charges are bullshit and communicating that to the people that resource our movements, that for us to organize in these times, we absolutely have to have resources to protect our people and provide duty of care for our people. That's something I'm proud, I'm pr I am proud about with NDN Collective, is that when people have stood with us and we engage in frontline activism and organizing, we have done a really good job of providing duty of care and looking out for our people and sticking through them. We also made sure that um, when legal funds uh, are raised, you know, for uh, for our for our folks, that it covers a way broader span of things than just the fees to pay lawyers. It covers things like even the clothes that somebody might need to wear in order to go to a court hearing. It covers things like counseling services 
for you and your family and your children because you're being attacked. It covers things like food and travel so that you don't miss your hearings and your, your you know, your hearings um, whenever they're coming up because then they'll give that as another excuse to attack you. It covers, um, it covers things like spiritual support. If you need to do a ceremony to do the protocol to, to, to provide protection for yourself and for your families, it includes everything from tobacco to the materials to the things that are needed. So the scope of what duty of care, of what we include here when we say that we're providing that, is much broader than just having legal representation. And um, because that's what the, the type of things uh, of putting that into practice that we keep, you know, we're the ones who keep ourselves safe. Um, the other, you know, big part of the du duty of care, quite frankly, you know, shout outs to, to Zoe and Sherry and the tactical media team is that having a tactical media team that as we're out there marching, organizing, protesting, you know, bringing to light these issues, that we have our own media so that we can document the repression that's happening and we can use that, one, to protect us, you know, when, 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 when they're physically attacking us so that the police know that they're being filmed. And number two, whenever it comes to legal battles that we might have to fight later, we have some evidence that proves that what's happening to us is actually happening to us because we know that white supremacy and the oppressive imperialistic systems like to uh, gaslight us and say, oh, well, that didn't happen to you. You know, so these are some of the things that are really imperative. The other thing uh, that we've done here is we we, we actually created um, we created a community of care um, uh, position and are slowly building a community of care networks that originally started off as this idea of, of street medics, right? Having the ability to. Uh, you know, stop wounds and stop, um, you know, uh, uh, um, injuries from happening, you know. Um, but uh, but also what it is, is actually by, ha by having an emphasis on that, it's creating more of a community of care of like, okay, who is going to, who is going to, when we, when we go to the streets, um, who, what is going to be our protocol for how we engage with the ambulance for the fire, the, how, how are we going to engage with the fire department? How are we going to engage with these different systems, many of them in which we're fighting? And so it, it's us providing that for our people when we organize part of that duty of care, but it also starts to strengthen what our political analysis is, you know, when we're organizing in the streets, what is that in, in, in practice with those systems? Um, what emergency rooms are we going to take? Are we going to use the ambulance service? We're going to take people ourselves. You know, going through the practice of thinking about a holistic approach around what community of care means uh, is really important. Jail support, supporting people when they go to jail, making sure that people are not, whenever possible, are not uh, going to court by themselves. Um, having at least one person who's sitting there keeping track, keeping track of, uh, you know, who their representation is, when their hearing is, and checking in on how they are doing when they're uh, facing these charges or when these things are happening to them. So these are all sort of different areas of how we're providing um, community of care um, and, and really pushing on our supporters to also understand that those are expenses. Those are, those are expenditures that are real, you know, for our people. The other thing, last thing is for us here um, being able to provide medicines consistently. Uh, you know, we have a team here called um, Healing Justice and People, Culture, and Belonging, and they provide these packages that have medicines, sage, sweetgrass, teas, you know, uh, optical, you know, sort of uh, uh, medicines, uh, traditional medicines, um, different things like that to support you when you're going through those challenging times that you're in, you know, sending, um, you know, sending gifts to not only the person who's experiencing political persecution or, or, or legal, you know, persecution, but to the families too, because they're also experiencing it with it, with the people, 
even if they're not the ones that are visible. So those are some of the things that we're doing and I think that we're learning as we go uh, and uh, some of the lessons uh, of some of that. And we want to be able to share some of that too because some things we do really well and you know, sometimes we, we're still learning too, you know? you know. Thank you for that. And yeah, I'm really just sitting in this conversation. I'm just so excited to hear the, the exchange of information and knowledge. You know, I'm just kind of like, oh, like I'm like this is very educational. Like yes, okay. So, anyways, <laughs> thing for me. <laughs> uh, thanks, uh, our, our whole team. Um, and so we, we keep going. So I'll stop trying to talk so much here. Uh, Mary, same question. You know, again, like we just heard of all the things that are going on to our communities. How they're they're basically under attack. You know, under attack from the get. And if you could share about like how how you resist and tear down, but also how you're building and cultivating systems of care and support. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, M4BL, uh, we're an a ecosystem of over 100 Black-led organizations. And part of our uh, commitment to one another and what brings us and calls us, you know, into um, a movement building commitment is this question that we always raise is, what can we do together that we can't do alone? And uh, part of that is being able to, and what we see as important to being able to dismantle uh, and build um, is to be able to create broad-based coalitions, alliances um, rooted in, you know, radical left politics and radical and um, righteous values um, in order for us to uh, be able to, you know, um, do shared work, do collective work, but also not be, um, you know, like some of the other comrades just named, not also allow the state to try to, you um, disunify our work and our movements um in which i think we've been together and for Bale is celebrating 10 years at this point you know we've seen the ebbs and flows of folks come and go and many folks have been there uh from the beginning and have stayed and when i say folks i'm talking about organizations that have made commitments to one another and i think that is what um is going to be required of us um you know to be able to take up and to take uh take on the enemy in our opposition of the, the US empire is that we must, you know, be uh, willing to be a commitment to one another, you know, cause our, our opposition does very well, you know what I mean? They have figured out how to um, organize with one another even beyond their differences, right? And they're clear about what unites them. And we all have to be united around the things that are important and uh, to us and the, the things that, you know, our shared vision for the world, not just the fact that we have a shared enemy, like that uh, will run its course. And so when we put out the vision for Black Lives, for example, uh, the policy platform, we wanted something that united us beyond, you know, uh, the things that made us angry, the things that keep us up at night, the, the terror that folks are experiencing in community um, and, and to be able to search something so we can move from a place of longing and desire and hope uh, beyond just, um, you know, the righteous anger that we have, uh, you know, for the, the, the world and the, the, the state uh, as we know it. I think what also uh, is super important um, in terms of this the dismantle piece is to also to see our cultural tools as weapons and as medicine. And so when I uh, talked earlier about the movement Mass Choir, uh, I, you know, I come out of Southern Organizer, Southerners in the Ground, shout out, is my forever political home, which carries on that legacy of you know, freedom singing as a way to, um, you know, not just unite our voices, but also to speak to our opposition while we're on the front lines, also to give instruction and to communicate, also to be able to be a balm uh, and to nurture one another's spirits um, when we're in, you know, the heat of the battle, if you will. And I think that, you know, part of the dismantle too um, is the fact that we have to continue to confront uh, confront power and to challenge power. And so, um, you know, in as much as the state repression would, uh, you know, would have us think that, oh, well, we shouldn't turn up or, oh, we shouldn't take it to the streets or, you know, we shouldn't do those things because they're going to ramp it up. And, you know, in as much as I, I do and understand the need for all the digital tools, hell, we need all the tools, right? We need to use all the tools that's at our disposal. However, um, this is something that you know our 
our work and our challenge to the state must be manif made manifest and our but bodies must be put on the line. We cannot fight this thing, you know, just in the internet and digital space. We have to use all of it um, in service to confronting the state. And so, but in how we do what we do, right? How we engage in direct action, how we bring arts, culture uh, to the space, since why we're doing the, um, radical popular theater with the comrades from Aji Harte. Like we have to be able to demonstrate and show all the ways, not just to piss off our enemies, but also as a, a clearing call, if you will, for other folks and for the Maxis to be able to stand with us and to see um, and be compelled by the way we do what we do in order to bring more people along because we know our power is in, you know, our numbers and we don't just want you know, numbers for the sake of having numbers, right? We wanna go wide and deep, right? And so, which also then pivots me to uh, how we're building systems of care. And uh, I was just hearing like what Indian Collective is doing and the work that y'all are doing to like help support flank, you know what I mean? And hold down uh, people and that duty of care, that language use is, is so profound and necessary. And we don't talk about it and for me, I don't think we've used the language duty of care, but I'm like, Yes, uh, that resonated with me. And, you know, for years we've, um, you know, every year we hold a pot of our resources to make sure that, you know, if any of the comrades inside of our membership, you know, is faced with the police and state repression, you know what I mean? That we have money set aside to say, okay, what do you need to help with legal resources? What do you need to get that bail? What do you need to, um, you know, to sustain and support your life so that you won't lose your apartment. We have been able to move resources to some of the cop city comrades so folks won't lose apartments or folks can be able to, you know, keep the lights on and, you know, make sure they can move money to whomever's still holding things down. Um, you know, because we know like when the state, there's one thing to take the arrest, but then when the, the complete interruption of your life and that grueling process of having to be inside of the courts and folks being on a bracelet and, you know, that, uh, the, the, literally the thought of it just makes me, um, it's, uh, it's just something that, that just, I can feel it in my body because I've been there before. And so, you know, any ways that we can uh, help mitigate that uh, to make sure that um, after the disruption or when we, you know, give victory in those circumstances that folks haven't lost everything um, in order to, yeah, to pick up the pieces from what happens when the state interrupts your life. And then we also, you know, have a fund where we've supported families uh, who have experienced uh, police violence, you know, and we've been able to move resources because, you know, it, it's heartbreaking as it is to have a loved one pass away, but then also to know that the state has done this, you know, through state sanctioned violence and murder, you know what I mean, is devastating. And so we've been able to stand up a fund too, where our folks can like, yo, you need a headstone. You need to pay for funeral burial costs. You know what I mean? Like you need to get therapy and support, you know? And, and I think, um, and I love to see the synergy and alignment, the way movement forces are thinking about how we take care of our people beyond the, you know, the ways in which, you know, the state would, would do, which is trash, right? And so how we do it with the level of intention uh, I think is super important and it's just beautiful to see that synergy. But I think what is also, um, you know, been very true here in Atlanta is, you know, the, the RICO happened, the domestic terrorism, the raids happened. And I think many of us was like, oh shit y'all, we should be on fucking high alert. I'm sorry, I'm cussing. I don't know if that's loud, uh, but we should be on high alert, you know? And so, you know, folks begin to have the conversations were already happening, but I think we were, you know, committed to doubling down on like, how do we make sure we have safety plans? How do we make sure that folks have done their pod mapping? How do we make sure that, you know, um, that uh, our relationships are strong, right? Because as folks had named, uh, that is, I, I believe, one of the key ways that the state, um, you know, indirectly does their work is by being able to take advantage of the ways in which, um, you know, we, you know, we, um, when we don't operate principally with one another and know how to principally engage in conflict and disagreement. And so part of that is also, you know, everybody, you know, having to really be um, intentional and really like reset our values when we talk about how we want to be in um, 
polit strong political relationships and understanding what is at stake when we're not, and also how to get in right relationships when you know things fall apart, um, and be able to not only just talk about abolition in a theoretical approach, but our praxis um, modeling those things that we say we want uh, and we so desperately need. Um, and I also just want a quick shout out. I know um, M4BL, we've done a lot of work with one of our member organizations, Vision Change Win, who has like, you know, deeply invested a lot uh, in, you know, uh, the ecosystem as a whole, but the members in, inside of it to help us show up our security practices, how we're thinking about digital security. We're learning about VPNs and, you know what I mean, all of these different tools that we have. Um, so that we ain't out here being sloppy, you feel me? We ain't out here being undisciplined. Um, and some of that even looks like um, some of the comrades, um, I believe it was the DC comrades, the Harriet's Wildest Streams, um, and the, the one of the members of uh, the ecosystem were doing like a little clinic um, for folks to pull up to be able to get minor repairs done on their cars to prevent um, the pullover uh, from happening. Uh, and I think things like that also, you know, it's not just for the, the folks who are in the movement, but it's also broadly, you know what I mean, to our community to try to prevent that state, um, that state interruption on everyday people's lives, you know. And then um, the last thing that I'll say here is that um, myself, my wife and my com uh, Charlene, my comrade Kate, we've been committed to stewarding this building, which we're putting in the community and land trust called the MRF, the radical, uh, the radical the multi-use radical people's hall, because we do understand how important physical uh, infrastructure is, and, you know, to our movement in this time. And we're seeing this not just in Atlanta, but folks down in uh, Miami with the Freedom Lab, folks in um, St. Louis are building a movement hub, um, uh, folks in Chicago uh, led by EAT, uh, Equity and Transformation. So we're seeing several members inside of the ecosystem say, hey, y'all, how can we, you know, create the physical spaces we need to be able to gather, to be able to find sanctuary, to be able to find a meal and a, you know what I mean, a little snack, you know, things like that. But I think pl having places where we can harbor one another is super important to how we create that system of care. So I'll leave it there. Right on, thank you. Thank you so much for that. It's like layers and layers and layers of like, you know, <laughs> different things. It's not one thing, it's many things. Um, yeah. Lena, did you, uh, did you, you know, be interested, I guess, and, and let us know what, what systems of care and support we're, we're, you're, you're trying to build, I guess, as, as these, you know, things are over us. I mean, it's kind of the big list of, uh, yes, all the terrible things that are happening to our communities we're trying to organize for liberation. So just, yeah, what, what, um, you, you know, just can you share more about what, uh, you know, how you resist, tear down, but also build up these systems of care? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, one thing I'll start with is, you know, when we talk about systems of care or, or um, I think in thinking about the Palestinian struggle, you know, we are, Zionism is a genocidal ideology, right? We're, um, that is the opponent that we are up against. And so when we talk about meeting the material needs of our community, especially our community back home, and especially right now in Gaza, um, that is not charity. That is a duty that we have to our people so that we continue to survive and we continue to be on the land. Um, and so I think that um, understanding, that sort of a deeper understanding of meeting material needs is really important here. Um, and so when I think about that important to the Palestinian struggle, especially, that's kind of the, the grounding that I have. A lot of, I really enjoyed hearing the different answers that folks have had and the different work that um, y'all's organizations are doing. I think one thing that really stood out to me uh, in your answers and also in, you know, really deeply resonated with how we think as the PYM is there's a tendency in this moment, I think, in moments of really heightened repression um, and really heightened uh, pressure, I guess you could say, to fracture and to become very individualistic and talk about protecting yourself rather than thinking about this broader group, broader um, the broader scene. And so I think that question about being, or that point about being regrounded in the collective and being regrounded in organization is really important. Um, we are only going to win what we are organized enough to win. And so, and I think, and if it wasn't effective, if our organization, our ability to organize as peoples 
um, and our ability to come together as a collective wasn't effective, then the state wouldn't try to attack us in the ways that they do. And they wouldn't try to attack our infrastructure. They wouldn't try to attack our internal cohesion the way that they have been. And so I think regrounding ourselves in that, um, what some of the comrades have shared is around, you know, collective grief. Like in this moment, we've seen community uzzes. So community, um, I don't know how to explain this, not exactly a funeral, but like a thinking about mourning in a collective way and not just in an individualistic way, not just you as an individual, not just your family, but the community at large. Um, thinking about how we turn up, like show up for our prisoners, right? Um, Nick mentioned that a couple of times, and that's really important. Our communities and our, especially our organizers, especially the people who are trying to, who have this vision for a different world and are trying to push it, they are criminalized. And not just as criminals in the broader sense, but especially for the Palestinian movement as terrorists, right? And we're seeing that language now being used in Stop Cop City and other places. Um, so not just to say that we are criminals, but that we're irrationally violent, that we don't know what we're doing, right? And so how do we um, show that, no, these people are grounded in their communities, that these people are, um, they're not, you know, they're not this other, um, they're not being labeled in this way, in this sort of negative, irrational, like smear kind of way, but these people are part of their communities. These people are um, fighting for justice. They're fighting for what's right. And so how can we show that collective power in the courtrooms, in the streets, um, that there's no place where people are being fractured and left to, to handle things on their own? You know, if there's a student that's being threatened with expulsion because of their work in an SGP, we need to be able to show up for them. And that takes, that takes organization, it takes a collective. And so I think in thinking about how we fight back and how we push back, that it's so important to reground ourselves in those, um, in those principles. Um, and I think the other piece here too, in thinking about collective and thinking about organization is um, how do we bring more people in, right? Instead of fracturing, instead of thinking about how do we, you know, we're so afraid of informants or infiltrators. How do we think about actually, this is a moment where people's consciousness is being raised. How do we use that? How do we reach more folks? How do we bring more people to be more politically aware um, of not just what's happening in Palestine, but in all kinds of, of different struggles that are going on around the globe. Um, you know, that's that's such a critical point, right? If we, our movements, the point of our work is to bring other folks in, right? Is to build power. Um, and so that's how we're going to do it is through those two different things. Um, yeah, I think, and I think maybe the final point around collective, the importance of the collective is in a moment like this, it's really heavy, right? When you think about like, what does it mean to materially support, or, like significantly support somebody who's lost whole branches of their family? I don't know what that means, but I think it's important for us to uplift our martyrs, right? And to not say that this is just a tragic death, but this is a martyr. This is somebody who has given the ultimate sacrifice for Palestine and how can we ground ourselves in that um, and carry that memory for it and carry the struggle for it because ultimately, that's the greatest way that we can honor their memory is through carrying the struggle for it and not letting moments like this break us because that's exactly what the state wants to do. It wants us to be quiet. It wants us to go away. So how do we rise above that and continue to struggle and continue to do the work that we're doing despite all of the things that are being put in our way? Yeah, thank you so much for that. You know, I think and we, we live in this individualistic society who's trying to uplift you as an individual all the time and, and isolate you as just being alone. And just that reminder that, that we're experiencing this collectively, even if experience is our own little lane of perception, we're still all experiencing the world and it's happening to us. These things are, are happening. This collective grieving is happening. And, and so I'm, I'm just thankful you shared that. Um, it just gave me a little perspective because stuff's hard, you know, like I get sad sometimes just when I start thinking about it, you know, I'm not going to lie. Um, and so did we have we have one more question i don't know if anybody had any, any responses or, or, or thoughts for each other before I, I ask this last question yeah i think i just want to say like i know that a lot of what i shared has been heavy and a lot of what's happening to all of our communities is heavy um but i think that's also the fire that fuels us i don't want to speak for everybody else but for myself like that's what i say when i mean like we can't let moments like this break us right it's mm -hmm. even if like I'm gonna go down fighting if I go down, right? So how do we continue yes, to have that fire? Honey. How do we use that as a way of being, of fueling the fire rather than saying like, okay, it's heavy and I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop, you know? So I just wanna reframe that a little bit. 
I, I want to add something to that too. I, I want to add that I'm trying this, not that I'm successful at it. Um, becoming stronger in times of repression and leaning into love and not having not having it just become jaded because i have noticed my my walls are up my jadedness is up they're trying to take i'm a father of four children they're trying to take me away from my children and lock me up for standing up for my children's future that's personal to me oh yeah that's personal to me and i've been trying hard to say how can i in the, in the time when there's all this pressure and all this shit is coming down on us how can you still find a way to leave lead with with love and have compassion because that's what we're trying to fight for in this world and and, and that's why i say i don't think i'm doing it successfully I don't think I'm doing it successfully, but I'm trying to. I'm trying to make sure that I just don't become so jaded of what's going on in this time, that I don't have the capacity to lean in to the world that we can create by the, by, by winning shit, you know? And, and so I've been balancing that a lot of like that, of going that back and forth of leaning into i don't wanna i want to be fierce with 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 love because i want to show that to my children i want to show that to my people i want to show that um but then i still feel like this this jadedness this, this the walls are high because the stakes are high right now you know and so um i'm trying to figure that out i'm trying to walk what that looks like, because everything I was ever taught about being a father, you got responsibility, you know, um, and to raise your children and to be there for your children, to help your children. And, and I'm, and I do that. I'm trying like hard as hell to do that. That's what fuels all of my fights, you know, but then somebody tries to take me away from my children. You know, that's, that's, that's coming after my, everything that's part of my whole existence and my identity. Um, and so that balance of that too. And I just decided to make it a practice of trying to lean into the love part um, because otherwise I'll become so jaded, you know, just, you'll just be all warrior, you know, uh, all fight. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that's where I'm kind of like, it's, I, I was, I'm navigating the waters of that, I would say. Yeah, yeah. yeah I just, um, well, you said that, um, you know, brings up a lot because, um, you know, uh, as a mother in this struggle, my wife and I, we have had to have those conversations like, yo, what's our plan if they come to the door? You feel me? Like, what is our plan? Mm -hmm. Who holds the kids? How do we instruct them? How do we make sure that, you know, that they're not traumatized, you know, through any of this and as much as we can prevent it, you know? And um, I think what, uh, and so one just like that, that loomingness of like wanting to protect your shorties, want to protect your kids and all the babies in this movement, right? There's little children, you know what I mean? Who have mobilized around Cop City, you know what I mean? We've done their demonstrations at City Hall, you know what I mean? The sweetness of it all. And, you know, uh, knowing that there are some situations and, and that we may or may not be able to prevent, you know what I mean? When the the state does what they do. Um, and I think that one of the things like, you know, and engaging in a long-term struggle and, you know, we've all committed to protract the struggle. We like, you know, we've committed our lives. This is what we're gonna do. Like we fight them for a better future, but also like how to, um, I think a part of our work is to figure out how do we um, not grow cynical not grow cynical, you know what I mean? And not mm. be so, like you were saying, Jada, like we tried it, it didn't work before, we did this, you know? Like that sort of um, that sort of energy. Cause like you were saying, uh, Leanna, like 
new people are coming. People are being radicalized. People want in and they, and we want to be able to pass along and, and, and broaden the circle of this movement that invites something, invite our people into something mm -hmm. that, you know, still has some hope about it. You know what I'm saying? And like people in the midst of like how horrible the conditions are right now, but like, you know, the work that we must do to like spiritually, you know what I mean? Keep it up, you know what I'm saying? For our people uh, to be, you know, come into a movement that, that feels alive, you know what I mean? That feels alive, I think is a huge part of our work. And I think that, you know, sometimes I know me, myself personally, like, I don't think a lot about the emotional labor or any, you know what I mean? I'm like, we do what we do because that's just what we do and we do what must be done. But it is a lot of needing to extend that way to connect with one another, you know, um, not just be able to coordinate actions and stuff, but like really taking the time to spiritually connect with one another, you know what I mean? To that that uh, connective tissue, you know, uh, is so needed, it's so needed. And so I hear you on the wall situation. And I think that I'm, I'm probably like, you know, on the opposite end, I'm like walls down, you know what I mean? I'm open, I'm open in all the ways, you know? And, and I, and if I'm being honest with myself, um, a lot of times it's just, you know, you get really tired, you get really tired. Um, but I think, uh, I think one of the things that, uh, has allowed me to keep on keeping on is that I learned very early on through a black queer feminist lens about how we do again what we do is so important so that is why we sing that is why we you know what I mean think about try to think about how we infuse humor into what we do you know spectacle you know what I mean and like uh you know how do we like our our tone uh, we set the terms of how we show up in the streets. You know what I mean? If we want to be angry, we'll be fucking angry. If we want to be, you know what I mean? Wild and ridiculous, we're going to be wild and ridiculous. But, and if we want to be loving and we want to throw flowers and bring humor and joy into the way in which we move, like that is so critical so that, you know, we stay in touch with our humanity, that I stay in touch with my humanity and they don't, and I don't let them take those parts of me that, you know, allow me to wake up every morning and choose, you know what I mean? Choose to give our lives to this work, you know, cause it's a daily choice, you know what I mean? Some days I'm like, yo, maybe I should just switch my avatar, you know what I mean? But every day it's a choice, you know? And so I think, you know, having to consciously make those decisions of how we move inside of this work is super important. Um, and I thank you for the vulnerability of what you just said. Cause you're right, yo, like, it's a lot happening and we could become, you know, put the walls up and all the things. Um, and even naming it, I think is, is, um, uh, you know, allows us, it, it, it invites us to make sure that we look over the walls to be like, who back there? Come on out of there, baby. You know what I mean? So, so thank you for saying that. Thank you all. I, it, it was refreshing to hear what you, what you shared too. Cause, cause, cause I, I, I know that I, I I know where we need to be, you know, um, but like taking me away from my babies makes me a whole, you know, whole different thing. So, uh, and so I really appreciate what you shared because it really helps me. Uh, it really helps me ground too in that, you know, and, and I think that this conversation we're having, a lot of other people are experiencing in different forms, you know, this conversation we're having right now. And, and to hear you say, you know, especially from you in the battles that you've been leading out there, you know, and fighting to be like, hey, people, people are coming into this movement. We need to put our walls down to to build power. That is inspirational to hear that mm -hmm. for me. And, it's, and that's medicine. So I just want to I want to say thank you for that, too. Right on. Yeah. Right. I wanted to add one thing like I, I hate having the last word, but everyone's, you know, I love all the different um, input that folks have and it's giving me other ideas. I think one thing that we often have, like at least for me, like this laundry list of like talk about state repression, right? It's like, okay, you've got the lawsuits, you've got the doxing, you've got the infiltration, you know? I think one thing we don't always name is psychological warfare, which I think is what a lot of what we're naming mm -hmm. is, right? Like this way of trying to break ourselves mm -hmm. down and like that's a lot harder to fight than fighting like a civil lawsuit, right? 
And how do we find that like core of ourselves that is going to keep going in spite of everything? I think that's the harder question to answer, but I think it's the most important one. Um, even when things are stacked against us, what do we ground ourselves in? That is the spark, right? Um, but I think that psychological warfare is something that would be great to maybe at a later webinar dig into more. I think it's something that's a little underexplored. We'll write that down. I'm in. I want to talk about it now. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, I needed to hear it. Just to be honest, like, I've been, you know, same here. I think Jay did. Like, I think the other day I was like, have I been burned out for a decade? You know, I was like talking to a friend. <laughs> Is that why I'm feeling this way? You know, like it's ups and downs and lefts and rights. And it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. And, and I, I just, I just became a parent like two years ago. And that's a whole other layer of like, Oh, didn't think about that before when I was doing some stuff. Um, but yeah, I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, we're gonna have one last question. It's just you know the the standard. Can you give us uh, let us know where folks can get updates from you know follow you where people can get updates and also if you have any calls to action. And Lena, if you want you want to start and then uh, we'll just go from there. Sure. I think um, for Palestinian Youth Movement, our Instagram is a great place to get updated in terms of what's happening. So at Palestinian Youth Movement on Instagram. And then um, two things. So a more immediately, Land Day is on the 30th. That's a really important um, day historically for Palestinians. Uh, and it's also been called as a shut it down day. So I would really encourage folks to be out there in the streets um, or taking other kinds of creative actions. And I'd love to see um, you know, our indigenous and Palestinian relatives getting together for that as well, thinking about land back for land day. Uh, and then we also have really excitingly uh, uh, the People's Palestine Conference, which is happening from the 24th to 26th of May in Detroit. Um, there's a lot of things to say about this, but, you know, I think to that point of we're seeing so many people be um, galvanized in this moment and be politically conscious in this moment. And so this is a really important convening space for folks who want to get involved in the movement, even if you've never been involved before, um, or even if you have been, it's be a great, it's going to be a great place where a bunch of different people are going to come together. Um, and it really is its name, People's Palestine uh, Conference. And it's going to be in Detroit, which has a long history of its own, uh, le like liberatory organizing work, union organizing work, um and we really encourage folks to to come out it's going to have lectures workshops panels it's going to be a great time well, thank you for that i think they're trying to drop some links in the chat they also let's like definitely read the description there's a bunch of calls to action there um mary if, if you could do the same just let know uh, let folks know how to keep in touch and then also keep updated and then any calls to action people should know are, are about to happen you know? yeah uh i think uh, there's a few accounts to be following friends uh, make sure you follow Stop Cop City account on IG, uh, the Movement for Black Lives, where you'll learn, you know, stuff being amplified from Atlanta, but, you know, work from comrades all over the country that are uh, inside of the Movement for Black Lives and the ways in which folks are engaging in campaigns toward this People's Response Act, but also some of the other creative ways and things that folks are doing uh, to build. Um, and also um, the Atlanta... Um, Community Press Collective, ACPC. Follow them or they're on um, IG or on Twitter, because I think that is probably where the most reliable, literally the most reliable news source when it comes to um, what is actually happening uh, in the in the political landscape of Atlanta. Uh, they're the ones to follow. And then follow Cop City Vote. I think uh, as we continue to struggle around uh, this referendum process, Folks can find updates there around what's happening with that specific strategy. Also, uh, the Save the Wilani, um, Save Wilani on Instagram, uh, super important to follow as well. Um, every Friday, uh, there's a picket that happens um, at the site to continue to just make sure that there's a physical presence uh, of folks, you know, making sure that people know we still about it's still stop cop city for us, um, and. You know, for folks who are in Atlanta, tomorrow there's a mobilization to City Hall at 10 a.m. Uh, to demand that the mayor, um, Mayor Andre Dickens, drops the appeal. And so we're encouraging folks to, you know, blast him online, you know what I mean, show up at his house, go to, you know, his office, find him in the street. Um, we really need him to drop this appeal so direct democracy can be engaged. Um, and then for folks who are interested and want to talk more about uh, some of the efforts around um, what is happening with all of these cop cities that are being built. I would encourage folks to reach out to me. Uh, 
My email address is mary at m4, the number four, bl.org. And if you enjoy some movement singing and want to be, um, you know, part of a movement mass choir, this Sunday there's an interest meeting here in Atlanta. Many people have been like, is there a virtual option? Um, and me and my buddy's like, I don't know if we could like sing virtually because there's a delay. But um, right now it's going to be in person. Uh, and so folks can find that on my IG. It's rolling around the internet. Um, uh, to register and sign up so you can get information that's going to be happening Sunday uh, from three to six. And there's also some stuff folks should, uh, I feel like it's a lot, my bad. But if you follow any of those accounts, what you'll also see is the week of action coming up um, in order to um, highlight what is happening at the state house as they try to overturn bail and as they try to enact some of the most heinous uh, anti-immigration laws that we've seen in a long time. I mean, Georgia do raggedy shit all the time, but this here is um, very much like the bill that we just saw get passed in Texas, where essentially you can, police can arrest anybody that they suspect or think is uh, undocumented. So week of action coming up, and uh, many of these accounts will be amplifying that, including bar business. So yeah, just many things to follow. And I think folks should also just make sure that, you know, Earth Day is coming up, friends. And that is a, a big day for uh, folks fighting in the cop city struggle, environmental uh, sector, et cetera. And so look out for, for things to come on that front. Thank you so much for that. And then they're in the chat too. So it is a lot of stuff. We're trying to, to make sure to drop some links so people can, can get involved uh, where they're at. Right and on. then Nick, uh, if you want to share how people can keep, keep updated, uh, follow your work. And then also if there's any calls to action that, that you want to share, please do. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so yeah, you know, follow, follow Indian Collective on on pretty much. Um, it's at Indian Collective on all the all the platforms. Um, for us, this is really key because, like, uh, you know, we're out here in South Dakota and uh, in a place that's really physically, you know, isolated from. Uh, the rest of the country. We're not in a place where there's like a big market. And so like our media sometimes is our only lifeline that we got. And so really encouraging people to follow our platforms here at Indian Collective on Instagram, uh, uh, Facebook. I don't even know all of the other ones. Um, we also have a podcast. I'm actually sitting in the studio at the moment called Line Back for the People. And this podcast, Land Back for the People, is continuing to talk about the state of the Land Back movement and brings a variety of guests in to continue unpacking what Land Back means, uh, both in actual, like, the return of indigenous lands back into indigenous hands, um, but also uh, what we're doing to dismantle the system that made it possible for the stilling of our lands in the first place and that are that is structurally set up to maintain the theft of our land so check out land back for the people podcast also we always take recommendations of people who we think should be on that podcast um, and having more cross-intersectional um movement folks um for us to be able to talk uh with each other on that podcast uh uh the other one right now for us is a, a couple big camp campaigns we have a big campaign in Rapid City, South Dakota, called Rapid City versus Racism, in which we're calling upon the Department of Justice to investigate into the murders of indigenous people at the hands of the Rapid City Police Department. Um, so continue to watch uh, us as that escalates and as we call for the DOJ to hold some of the police accountable here, at least creating a, a uh, you know, creating uh, creating some accountability. You, uh, the other big uh, campaign that we're working on right now is, uh, is a campaign uh, called Protect the Gesapa. Um, Gesapa is what we call the Black Hills out here. Um, it, it, one, you know, one, one in every 25, about 25 percent of our lands in the Black Hills are currently under mining claims by um, national and transnational corporations who are polluting our lands out here in the Black Hills. And so we'll, we have different calls to action that will be coming out uh, in the springtime around uh, around you know protection of our sacred homelands out here in the Black Hills, and most recently you know stay tuned to our platforms. We are working really really hard 
to fight for the liberation of Leonard Paltier, who is 79 years old. I talked to him today. He's in his 49th year of incarceration for a crime that he did not commit. Um, and, uh, you know, he was accused of killing two police, uh, two FBI agents on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in, in my homelands in the 70s when, when the American Indian movement or when the FBI decided to, uh, you know, wage war against the American Indian movement. Leonard is still alive. He is an elder. Um, he is his health is deteriorating. Our call to action is asking people across this country to reach out to the Attorney General Merrick Garland and ask for compassionate release. To ask for the compassionate release of Leonard Paltier where his, his health is deteriorating um, and uh, he wants to get out so that he can tell his story. He can tell his story of his 49 years of incarceration, and so we're asking people to um, to call upon Merrick Garland, the Attorney General, to ask for compassionate release. Compassionate release is in process as far as um, there is sediment for it, but it's time for the Attorney General to realize that this is a call to action uh, from the movement from all walks of life, uh, and because we want Leonard to be able to come home. Um, and so we'll be posting more on um, on NDN Collective's platforms about calls to action, uh, specifically for compassionate release. So those are the things that I'll say now. Uh, we have we have a bunch of more stuff, um, and, and definitely support in solidarity the call to actions that we're both represented here too, uh, and, and and support them as well. All right, well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, again, I think that those, those there's some links in the chats uh, and also in the description so you can see some more about those calls to action. And if, if everyone can just wait maybe a minute or two, I'm going to close this out and I just wanted to check in really quick and then we'll call it a day. Um, but that was our show. So I'm going to cut away from you all. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thanks for everything you shared. I am so thankful this happened and that everything worked like it did. It went pretty good. And uh, we got to, like, learn a lot together. So learn. Yeah. Love it. Talk soon. I'm going to go to the closing, which this is this right here. So, all right, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, my name is Lorenzo Sarna. I was your host today. Um, thanks for joining. The, keep following these conversations. You got hashtag land back, hashtag M, uh, M4BL, hashtag, hashtag free Palestine, stop cop city, no killer cops. We're there all day, every day. And uh, yeah, let us know in the comments what you thought about the conversations. And a big shout out to the tactical media team, Sherry, Angie, Andrew Weldon, Kelly D, and me, your host, Lorenzo Serna. We'll see you on the next one. Thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, let us know what you thought. Thank you.